Um, so thanks everybody for coming Crypto Mondays. This is a, uh, a meetup, um, you know, for the community we do every Monday. It's just simply about you know people who are passionate about crypto to come out and hang out with other people who are passionate about crypto. And we have speakers here because uh, when we didn't have speakers, we didn't get as many people. So people want to come to speakers, so we try and have really good speakers. And we've got a great speaker here tonight. Um, you know, friend of mine, uh, David Kirkpatrick, who I first met in 2010, when um, I had, you know, I had actually, you know, early in my life, I had been a Wall Street analyst, and then I had run the world largest social network for MySpace, and then somebody offered to sell me shares in Facebook, and I thought I was the smartest guy on the planet to actually know what they were worth, and. I, I was shocked that it was worth, I think, 50 billion, and it was actively traded at 16 billion. But I didn't know if Zuckerberg could actually make it happen. And then I heard that there was this guy, David Kirkpatrick, who was writing this book called The Facebook Effect. Um, and he had had unfettered access. You know, he had left Fortune um, after 24 years, 26 years, um, to write the book The Facebook Effect. And my first question, you know, which I'll again ask him now, is. You know, why did you leave, you know, Fortune after all of those years to write the book? Okay, but you didn't even say that you predicted that Facebook would be worth $100 billion and made a huge, huge impression with that in 2010. Because Facebook had, I think Microsoft had invested in about a $15 billion valuation, which was considered crazy. So he went way out on a limb. And of course, now it's worth 980 billion. So I guess he was generally right. Um, and we kind of bonded over that enthusiasm. So the reason I left Facebook to write about Facebook, or I guess Fortune to write about Facebook, was because I saw that company as unique in all of the business journalism I'd done in the previous 20 some years, that in the sense that technology in the form of Facebook was having a more definable, obvious, fundamental effect on daily human existence than any business, any technology I had ever encountered. So I thought, well, that would be a fun thing to write a book about. <laughs> so I did. And, and, and so you had you know, spent a lot of time you know, with Mark as you were writing the book. Can you talk about that period? Yeah, I, I did spend a lot of time with him. I mean, I, I was deeply impressed with him at that time, I have to say. I mean. Um, in fact, the, the way I got started writing about Facebook was in September of 2006, two days after he launched the news feed, which if anybody is familiar with the history of Facebook, was an ungodly crisis for them. Because none of the users liked it. It was like, and 10% of their users were actively protesting on the platform, and 10% of the customers of any company protesting is a bad thing for any company. And I had lunch with him in the middle of that. For the first time, I, you know, PR person says, you want to have lunch? Of course I did. So he was completely blasé about it. He, he knew it was going to pass. Um, and I, wrote, I, I had lunch with him, and I wrote a piece which was titled, Why Facebook Matters. This is in late 2006. <clears throat> At that time, it was still a student thing. And most business journalists thought it really didn't matter <clears throat> in any kind of big way. But the thing that really convinced me was not so much that it was a social network that could grow larger and adults could go on it maybe eventually. It was knowing him and talking to him like this for two hours and realizing the incredible clarity, focus, determination, and certitude that he had. Um, and I had the fortune of knowing, of knowing Gates and Jobs and Andy Grove and those kind of people, um, and he really felt a lot like them at age 22, I believe he was at that time. So I said that in my article, that he seemed like a natural CEO, and I also told the story in the article that when I said that, his face went like, ew, I, I, I didn't do this to, to make a business. I just did it because it's cool. You know, that's, that was the attitude he had then. That's not the attitude he has now. Um, so. And, and look, and, and I, I think that's one of the super interesting things is, is I think both of us have been on this journey with Mark, you know, having seen it very early. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, and 
what we thought, you know, the path we were on and the path we find ourselves on today are obviously extraordinarily different. Can you yeah, yeah, so, expand on that? Well, I'll tell you another anecdote. I'm, I run a conference business called Techonomy, and the best thing that ever happened to us as a company is that two days after Trump was elected, we had Mark Zuckerberg on our stage, and I was interviewing him, and he said, it's a crazy idea that fake news on Facebook affected the election, which is like one of the great quotes <laughs> of the last decade and happened on our stage, so we got a lot of mileage out of that. Um, and when you're a little tiny conference business, that sort of thing matters. <clears throat> but you know, it just goes to show how wrong he was. And really, I was already very dubious about the power of Facebook and, 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 and Amazon, uh, Google, all of them. I, at the time, I felt sort of worried about all of them equally. But I was worried, and I had written about how I was worried. Because the sheer scale of those companies was unprecedented, and the power that they were amassing economically and socially and a lot of other ways, and of course now it's all grown infinitely, dramatically, not infinitely, but a lot, a lot, a <laughs> lot, a lot more. There were no trillion dollar companies back then. But when Trump was elected, and when Zuckerberg first denied that it could possibly have anything to do with Facebook, and then, as it very quickly proved, that it did have a lot to do with Facebook. Russian manipulation on Facebook, Cambridge Analytica data being stolen from Facebook and used to aid the Trump campaign, um, an enormous range of oversights on Facebook's part in governing uh, how its systems are used by political actors. Um, that really began a, a dramatic souring on my part uh, of, of confidence in the company, and of course on the part of almost every other journalist, business or otherwise, so that at this point, Facebook literally has no public defenders. I would say maybe there's maybe like you can find one in a thousand people who know a lot about it are their defender, but they basically have essentially no outside defenders at this point. And uh, I think it's appropriate because I think they have had enormous harmful influence on society, and especially in democratic politics. I mean, in the conduct of democracies in countries all over the world. Uh, do you, do you think Mark gives a fuck? <laughs> um, on the evidence, you'd have to say no. I mean, it's hard to believe that he doesn't care that we've seen largely, in, you know, we've seen this amazing rise of autocrats all over the world, not just Trump in the United States, but, you know, Duterte in the Philippines, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Modi in India, you know, and he, you know, Modi's not quite as bad as some of those others, but he is increasingly an autocrat. And every one of those, and also uh, Orban in Hungary, the current uh, group in Poland, you know, there's a lot of countries. In every single one of those cases, Facebook is the primary media in those countries, and Facebook is actively and consciously and really smartly abused by the autocrats and their allies. And Facebook, in every one of those countries, does absolutely the bare minimum it can do to stop it because it wants the approval of the government. And you heard, for example, forgive me just for going on a little bit more. No, no. There's a great book that recently came out, a biography of Peter Thiel. Maybe, maybe you've heard this anecdote, but, you know, Peter Thiel uh, is on the board of Facebook and has been from the very beginning, right? So that's interesting in itself since he was a Trump supporter, spoke at... Republican convention on Trump's behalf. And look, I'm not down on Republicans per se. Per but, se. <laughs> but let's just say this. In the anecdote, in, the, in this book, Biography of Peter Thiel, uh, it's well known in, by all of us that Zuckerberg met with Trump in the White House twice, right? Had dinner with him. But in the book, it says that at one of those dinners, the two of them, Trump and Zuckerberg, made an explicit deal that Trump would not pursue regulatory pushback on Facebook if Facebook would not change its rules for political speech. So that says a lot, and even though that's an anecdote, not proven, it's by a very, very reputable journalist, to me, it feels right. And so, you know, now, you know, how do you think about how we move forward now? Where do you think we're going you know, with regards to Facebook's power? But you know, you're Mr. Metaverse, right? And so you think this Metaverse thing is great, and I'm not opposed to it. I don't have the same 
cheerleading quality that you do about it. I mean, this change of the name of Facebook to Meta, right in the midst of all the Facebook papers, revelations about endless harms. I mean, nobody in this room has read all those articles, each one of which is a feature-length indictment of Facebook. And there's about 140 of those articles that have emerged in the last six weeks in every major media you can think of. Um, and right in the middle of that, they decide, oh, I like, will change our name. I mean, really? Yeah. Well, I thought you said Zuckerberg doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> Well, I, you, you said that, I didn't exactly say that, but yeah, I wouldn't argue with that. And, and look, anything, any company that's worth a trillion dollars, and especially any entity of which there's never been another one that has half of humanity on its platform, maybe Google is in the range, but Google has a wider variety of products. I think when Google talks about that kind of number, it includes everybody who's using Android, which is really not exactly the same thing in my opinion. So Facebook has three and a half billion people using the combination of WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook Messenger, and Facebook. That's half of everyone on the fucking planet. Now, that is not going away anytime soon. And look, on balance, you know, but if you look at all the things they do, they do tons of great things. There's a lot of great things about Facebook that I would applaud. You know, small business gets the chance to advertise and people get to see their grandchildren's photos and all this shit. But if you believe like I do that at the same time there is a willful disregard for, for the impairment of democracy, which I happen to believe in, and there's plenty of other negative things, you know, the facilitation of racism, which the Washington Post just did a big article about yesterday, which wasn't even from the Facebook papers, it was from other data they got from inside the company that proved that Facebook knew the changes they were making led to more, that they supposedly made to reduce racist speech actually led to more racist behavior on Facebook. And, you know, there's example after example of this, and, you know, I would basically probably give the company more of a pass if it had any actual governance and if there was any evidence that there was an institutional effort to reflect and reform. But Facebook literally has no governance. It is an autocracy itself. Zuckerberg <laughs> controls 58% of the voting shares. He doesn't have to do anything he doesn't want to do and he doesn't listen to his board of directors unless they say what he wants to hear. And in fact, two years ago, the board, led by Ken Chenault and several other people who were very eminent business leaders that he had recruited to the board, uh, tried to create some governance around the, you know, hate speech and political manipulation. So what happened? He kicked them all off the board. That's what happens at Facebook. Wow, so it, it sounds pretty grim, right? I mean, what is, is there anything? Because it doesn't feel like the government is going to step in and do anything about Facebook, and it doesn't sound like anything else anywhere is, is happening to kind of impede, other than maybe the world is moving away from them because there's nothing constant to change. No, I disagree. Governments are stepping in. Uh, the European Union, more than any other single governmental entity, is really coming up with some very stringently uh, conceived and well-researched well, well laws. And this Digital Services Act that they're working on, which may or may not go into effect in comparable form to where it's now, you know, if it were implemented, they would be very impaired. You know, when, when, when GDPR happened, Facebook considered exiting Europe. But then they discovered, oh, it doesn't really matter much anyway. <laughs> you know, we can just do a few little changes and we'll be fine. So they did. But, you know, governments do have the power to force these companies to act fundamentally differently. And if it's, if it's a dramatic enough restriction, it will have impact. And I think the U.S. regulators are much more serious. I mean, look at somebody like Lena Khan at the FTC. That is a huge change. I mean... She is a radical leftist regulatory, you know, warlord. And, and that's a big deal. And Facebook is scared shitless. But Facebook, another thing about Facebook, they spend more on lobbying and have more lobbyists than any other company in any industry. Because they can. Because their net profits after tax in this, this, this calendar year will be in excess of $40 billion. 
after tax profits, more than four. So they can afford as many lobbyists as they need to do whatever they want. So, but I do think, even despite that, you will see increasingly stringent regulation. Even India is, is causing some serious change in how Facebook operates there. Brazil passed a law prohibiting Facebook from taking down uh, inciting political speech. Because Bolsonaro, who controls the parliament in Brazil, wants to be able to say anything he wants on there. So, you know, but, but that's a law that they have to abide by. They are getting put in every possible direction by government. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, look, I, I mean, I personally, you know, view them as kind of the kind of next gen Sackler family, you know, the, the opiate people that he's just, you know, at the end of the day, you know, he's, he's giving people what they want, but it's really, really bad for them, and he knows it, and he's going to profit the fuck out of it, and, you know, and I think that ends badly. Um, I hope it ends badly. Um, so, uh, you know, the idea is you know, we keep the half hour. I like to ask questions for 20 minutes. And then, you know, if there are questions from the audience, happy to let other folks ask questions. If anybody has something that they'd like to ask from David. Back here, David. Question for you. Yep. Somebody's got you ahead of you, but we'll get you in a second. So, like, honestly, one of my biggest uh, concerns when it comes to Facebook entering the metaverse is, especially for creatives, um, one thing that I don't feel a lot of artists know, considering how much people come to Instagram and Facebook largely for artistic content as well, um, so many creatives don't understand that when they post their media on there, they're basically giving Facebook and its existing entities intellect, like rights to the content they're posting. So one of the things I'm concerned about when it comes to how Facebook is entering the metaverse is as creatives are using NFTs, I'm imagining that Facebook is going to want to intersect with that in some way. Um, the things that are attracting about NFTs are intellectual property protection when Facebook and its associated things seem to conflict with that in so many different ways. How would you suggest, like what would you say that it would be something for creatives to take heed of as they're exploring this and Facebook's relationship with it? Well, that's a really well said, uh, and I wouldn't disagree with anything you said, although actually in terms of the literal IP, it belongs to the user. That, that is the case, although that doesn't mean in practice it belongs to the user, because Facebook monetizes it and the user doesn't, uh, on Instagram for example. And let's, let's, let's acknowledge, Instagram is an extraordinary tool for the creative community. My daughter is a professional illustrator, and she gets all her work from her Instagram, you know? Doodle Deli, it's very good, check it out. But, um, I'm serious, you really will enjoy it, Doodle Deli. Uh, but um, but so, so that's just an example, you know, there's millions of those, millions of people who are making a living based on Instagram, and that's a good thing. So, you know, it, you can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is why I would, you know, going back to an earlier question, I would be so happy if there was a sign of a desire for reform and improvement. You know, there have been some minor steps in the right direction, like the oversight board, which was a very creative step that I applauded, but it's a small step and it doesn't really have that much power, although it's getting more feisty and I think Zuckerberg's increasingly regretting having created it and giving it a hundred million dollars to operate. So that was a good thing, a, a, a good mistake he made. Um, I, I wanted, um, I mean, I think the metaverse is going to be founded on you know, a lot of a crypto foundation. The one point I wanted to make, in case I don't get another chance to do it in this crowd, I recently learned from a very well-informed person. You, know, you look at the whole chain of events with Facebook's crypto, own crypto efforts, with Libra and DM and whatever the hell they call it. What do they call it? Libra and... No, but they have some other name for it. Nobody even knows anymore because they've been doing it so long for so little effect. But what I recently learned was that the motivation for that was not what they said, you know, facilitating remittances and all these beautiful things. The real motivation, according to someone who's very close to the company and knows these people, is that they are true Bitcoin believers. And they believe putting a digital wallet, a crypto wallet, in the hands of billions of people would be a huge bullish thing for Bitcoin and that was the single most important thing to them, which makes a lot of sense and unfortunately reinforces the sort of dark narrative 
about their real thinking about anything. But I just wanted to make sure I said that here because if they do ever succeed in really deploying a cryptocurrency wallet at scale, for all of you crypto people, that is fantastic news. The best thing that could happen to you, by far, there are not billions of people with a crypto wallet now, but Facebook would like there to be. So for all of their evils, you might give them a little bit of a break for that one. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I think there may be some people in the room, kind of including myself, who might uh, disagree with you. Just that, you know, the whole idea of crypto is solving the community as opposed to Facebook, you know, as a corporation, which is solving for itself. So, kind of, I feel that we're actually kind of in a pitched battle for kind of the soul of the metaverse between, you know, Facebook, you know. Meta and, did I and say anything community. that would yeah. disagree? Did I say anything uh, that would contradict that? I don't disagree with okay, that. Okay, okay, <laughs> there weren't violent agreement. Great. So, <laughs> uh, uh, any other, anybody else have some questions? Somebody in the back had a question? One, two, three. Originally, I was going to ask you what you thought about the Lebo project. And, uh, <laughs> I guess I just said that. I know, yeah, I know. I'm not totally down answer, on it, by the way. It hasn't well, worked. Now, Gary Gensler testified before the Congress in 2018. Uh, he pointed out it was about the worst time to try to do that because it requires trust. And right. I had zero institutional trust. Um, but do you think they'll come back at it again? You just, well, I don't have a whole lot more to say, but I will say both Lou and I have said for some time that they would never succeed at it because of that trust problem, right? Don't you agree yeah, that yeah. also? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been very negative on their ability to execute, even though a case could be made that it might be a cool thing. And, you know, you could also view this whole metaverse shift that they're making as another way of running at that slightly covertly, right? Like, if they can build a virtual reality, you know, world where, you know, people start just hanging out in a second life -y and you know, World of Warcraftian kind of way, um, well, they'll need some money of some kind, and they can just start doling it out that way, and slowly but surely they'll be in that business again, you know? Uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that's another potential strategy for them. And look, I know Lou is really positive on the metaverse idea and I think it's it's inevitable that a large portion of that will envelop our lives and you know exactly in what form I don't know um, could I give my theory on the metaverse a little bit? Yeah, I was trying to think because I, I was a little afraid that I would be really an outlier of, of skepticism here tonight um, luckily I haven't had to talk too much about crypto but um the um, uh, what was I going to say? What was I about the metaverse? Oh, the meta wait, well, which part? What was I going to say? Uh, skepticism. Yeah. Skepticism about? Wait, no, I totally lost my train of thought. How about that? You were going to say Mark Zuckerberg's a robot? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Damn, that's what I, that's what I it was thinking. something about <laughs> the metaverse. metaverse. Your whole contact with the metaverse. Oh, I know. Yes, thank you. Okay. The Internet of Things. People don't realize the degree to which society is being instrumental, right? We are moving toward a world where computational measurement is going to be in everything over time. Not this table, maybe, but this microphone, probably my brain, your brain, your glasses, your foot shoes, whatever. <laughs> you know, in my opinion, people who are talking about this cartoony metaverse that Zuckerberg presented in his 80-minute movie are missing another way of thinking about it that could be more profound and more healthy because more integrated with actual physical reality. You know, in other words, if actual physical reality is itself digitized, which it is becoming, then it is not such a fundamental contradiction that we might want to live in some kind of largely digital reality and it would not mean we have to stop breathing the fresh air and looking and smelling the roses and this, by the way, is what Evan Spiegel believes. This is what Niantic believes. Those two companies in particular, I think, are among the ones who I really buy their vision for 
a more augmented reality kind of metaverse transition. And Lou was telling me before that he views that as metaverse as much as putting on stupid goggles and spending your whole life, you know, getting ice cream. Yeah, no, no, exactly. I totally agree with that. I think once you leave reality, you're into the metaverse. Like, you know, just looking at your cell phone, that's, you know, and I think every day for the rest of my life, you know, we're going to spend more time in the metaverse and, and that time is going to be more immersive. So we got time. One more question. There you go. Uh, what's your... Oh, she was raising her hand for you? Yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah. yes. <laughs> what's your opinion on the competition in like social media and just like market between TikTok and Facebook? Oh. Well, TikTok's winning. I mean, at the mm. moment. I mean, if one of the reasons Facebook is acting so desperate is not really because every major media company is documenting how they're facilitating racial hatred and the decline of democracy. It's because their business is being <laughs> taken away by the most in the most important demographic, which is people your age, right? And TikTok has had much more success than anybody would have expected. I mean, think about how interesting it is that Trump briefly tried to ban it because it's Chinese, right? And then he gave up on that entirely. You know, but, but his instinct was, maybe Zuckerberg even put him up to that for all that I know. I don't know. But it is interesting that it is fundamentally still controlled by a Chinese company, and it is the most popular form of immersive entertainment that young people seem to have. Well, you know, we don't want to be too negative about Instagram, which is still very strong, and Snap also is much stronger now than I would have ever guessed it would be at this point, and has a lot of potential still. Do you use Snap too? Yeah. yeah so what do you use most of? Uh, probably Snapchat. You use Snap more than TikTok. Than TikTok. Okay. Well, but do you use TikTok too? Well, enough said. <laughs> and and not, no Facebook products? Okay, I'll tell you one, one, one slight caveat on that whole thing. What's it? You know, Americans miss a lot of the Facebook story because we don't use WhatsApp in the United States. We are the only country in the world that does not use WhatsApp. If you travel anywhere outside the United States, Anybody you talk to says, well, what's that mean? You know, call me, we want WhatsApp, do this on WhatsApp, that on WhatsApp, except for China, where it's, you know, we, where it's WeChat. But basically, um, WhatsApp has actually more legs, possibly, than any other Facebook product, and maybe even more, I don't know what the user number is on WhatsApp right now, but it's in the billions. Um, it's in the probably, what, does anybody know how many users WhatsApp has right now? A lot. 1.6 1. billion? Is that Marcy there? It is. Oh my God. Hi. How, you don't know how many they have? A lot. Okay, a lot. They have a lot. But do you think, don't you think WhatsApp is, if you were in Europe, you'd have to use it, right? I use it. You use what it. But, I use is my main. But do you use it to communicate with Americans? Increasingly? Depends where they are. Yeah. Be because you travel overseas a lot, so you started using it and then yeah. you started. But most Americans still don't use it. They just use us. Would you agree? I agree. Right. Yes, you're right. Marcy knows a lot about a lot. But, uh, <laughs> um, anyway, thank you for that question. Okay, everybody, let's give David a big hand. This is awesome.